Hello, BookTube. My poor, neglected BookTube. I thought we'd uh, continue with a library tour. <laughs> this is the one, two, three, four, five. This is the fifth bookshelf of the tall east wall bookcase. Uh, and there are, once again, no transverse books. So we'll go straight on to the books themselves. Uh, but we can't really go straight on to the books themselves because of the way this particular shelf, part of the shelf, this particular shelf has uh, bevels on either corner of the shelf, which means that if you're if you're a dyed-in-the-wool book hoarder, you will put shorter books in and wedge them out. So you can't pull them straight out because the bevel's in the way. Uh, but it, it allows you to fit two more books. So <clears throat> that's a long way of saying we're going to have to work our way around here. So we'll pull out the first tall book, which is this, Journeys Through Many Lands from uh, 1935, an old... Uh, illustrated and black and white photo travel book that I just love. Uh, I love these sorts of things. This was owned by a young woman named Mary Lou, who put her name in it, and also, I don't know if you can see in the picture, this is me. <laughs> she also annotated it all throughout, and when I saw that, she when she finds a particularly ugly animal, she says, this is Johnny, and puts an arrow next to it. When I found that, that from a, you know, a young woman who is now almost certainly dead of old age, I had to get it. <laughs> so, plus, I love, I love vintage travel books like that, anyway. Uh, and then a couple of uh, poetry editions that I got that I keep specifically because I think they're the best editions of their, of their authors. This is the, the uh, Jack Stillinger edition of The Complete Poetry of John Keats. Uh, which, which you get for the poems, but also for the annotations. It's got a vast amount of annotation in the back. Uh, and the same thing with this, the John Shawcross edition of John Donne, uh, his complete poetry. Where it's the same thing. It's You get the poems, but you also get a vast amount of varied edition. So, uh, you know, if I'm going to have... I mean, I have the Penguin Classics of both those authors, uh, but I also want... You, you want the definitive critical edition of a previous generation, uh, not only so that you can keep the definitive critical edition of the pro of the present generation on its toes, but also so that you can refer to the scholarship. So, uh, and then we go all the way to the edge to the book that was actually wedged underneath the bevel, and that is Li Low City, High City by Edward Seidensticker. This is, he is the, the translator, one of the translators, one of the most uh, financially successful translators of Japanese literature in the 20th century, and one of the translators of my beloved tale of Genji. And he did a, a sort of a. Uh, history slash memoir of his love affair with Tokyo and that's what this is and I got it because I love this this uh, understated what is this even uh, I don't even actually know who made this oh Knopf made this and they the reason they the, probably that they made it in this edition with no blurbs and no talk and no anything is because probably this was made as a companion to their paperback of his tale of Genji. <laughs> uh, uh, and I love it. I reread it. He, he was a really good raconteur in, in addition to being a really good translator. And then we have a classic Moby Dick. This is from one of you. This is, uh, the, uh, reader's digest version of Moby Dick. I was going on a little aria. See, he's got these wonderful line drawings. I was going on a little aria about how I love the old reader's digest copies of a lot of these things. And the one I couldn't find was Moby Dick. And because you're all wonderful within days, I had a copy, two copies, in fact, uh, and then, let me see here. We're going to put the poetry back where it belongs so that we're not losing our spot here and the vintage travel book. Back. All right, there we go. So we'll just move on from here. Next one is something we saw on this channel just recently. It had to come into this room. <laughs> it's When Passion Rules by Joanna Lindsay, <laughs> which uh, I, uh, I wrote about at length. I can't remember if I linked my review of this, uh, but I will do so this time, uh, just in case, because uh, I had a ball writing about it. Uh, and then uh, another thing that we've seen on this channel before in this book room tour, you, uh, certain themes make themselves apparent. And one of them is uh, is my love affair with, uh, with Washington, D.C., where I lived for a bit. And uh, despite the soul-crushing heat and humidity, I met a lot of wonderful people and I had a lot of fun. Uh, and this is uh, Washington Close-Up. Uh, by Ed Lowry. This is a uh, just a series of a lot, a lot, very similar to uh, the type of thing that we've seen in this room before. Of just, it's just a memoir of his time in Washington, uh, pen portraits of the great and less less than great statesmen that he knew, uh, encounters with presidents and generals and lawmakers, of that sort of thing. Plus, all throughout, wonderful reflections on the life of the city. 
at the time. Uh, this was this was the uh, during the the Harding era, so this would have been what uh, 1921, and back then it was uh, it was just just barely in the full flush of the of the United States involvement in World War One, and Washington was still pretty much a sleepy Southern town. Uh, in in some ways, and in other ways, it was becoming aware of the fact of what it had done in World War One and what that might have meant, and it was changing the mind frame and ch- changing the way senators and congressmen behave themselves for the good and bad. I just <laughs> was a lot packed in here because Lowry was a really good observer, a really good writer. Uh, and then we have uh, an old, another old classic. This is uh, the complete illustrated Sherlock Holmes uh, in one volume. Uh, Whenever I find one of those for 50 cents, I grab it. I end up not, end up not having any of them either because I grab it and then I send it out right away. <laughs> and whenever I find one's in good shape, I send it out right away. Uh, and then we have, uh, this is volume one of Walter Muir Whitehill's uh, Guide to the uh, Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. Uh, and this covers the uh, the the beginning and the, the, the so-called lean years when the museum was having trouble establishing itself, having trouble getting... Uh, acceptance from the, the Boston Brahmin class. Uh, and Walter Muir Whitehill was a big element in that. He was a, and it was typically self-effacing, but he was a big element in the success of the Museum of Fine Arts. And he's not known at all. It's called the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. I have no idea why it's not called the Whitehill Museum, but one way or another, uh, someday somebody will write a great biography of him because he deserves it, not just for the MFA, but for the Boston Public Library and for the Boston Athenaeum and on and on and on. Uh, but this is, a, this is a wonderful book. I mean, it's a history of the MFA, but it's also it's his pro style that you would, that you would get and read it for. Uh, and then we move on to the uh, very old classic. <laughs> this is the New Testament, uh, which Willis Barnstone refers to as the New Covenant. This is... Uh, a uh, very new and sing-songy, strange, intentionally paradigm-shattering translation of his of the New Testament with tons of fantastic commentary. Uh, so I, I, I yearn to find a copy of this in hardcover because my paperback, I reinforced it, but I read it all the time. I, re- I consult it whenever I have a New, question, a new Testament question, which is quite often. And it, <clears throat> it's not going to take the strain much longer. So I, I keep looking for a hardcover. Uh, I keep asking friends to, you know, stop by the Strand and get one because I'm sure it will be there. But uh, I will not be to the Strand anytime soon, so I can't do that myself. It'll show up at the Brattle. Eventually, it'll show up at the Brattle. Then we have another theme. <laughs> there are themes in this uh, in this library tour of mine, and I'm freely I freely admit it. Uh, and one of the themes is old Boston books. There's old Washington books. There's books about books and book essays. And there's old Washington or old Boston books. And this is one of them. Uh, Glimpses of authors. This is by Carolyn Tickner. Let me see if we, there's a if there's a picture of herself. Uh, yeah, here she is at her desk, as usual. Uh, and this is from uh, the early part of the of the 20th century, I think. Yeah, 1922, and it's it's just her. She was at the, the heart of literary Boston for 60 years, and this is her series of, of vignettes of authors, Dickens, of course, and a bunch of other people. Uh, and also, again, in between the lines, you read the you breathe the life of literary Boston of a century ago, and it's it's incredibly enchanting. Uh, then uh, another gigantic volume. This is the complete essays of V. S. Pritchett. In this gigantic volume, they, the, uh, this publisher, who was this Random House, did two volumes. They did an equally big volume of his collected short stories, and this volume, which is his collected uh, for pay book reviews and literary journals, uh, literary essays, and he's wonderful. He he wrote it. He was the Updike. He was Updike. He wrote about everything, but he wrote with considerable erudition and lots and lots. Uh, he had a very good ear for uh, quip, for a witticism, and so the book brims with it. Uh, on every single literary topic and subject and author you could imagine. <laughs> so it, I, I use it all the time. I have this floppy thing here, but I really like a hardcover. Again, the Brattle will provide. I will find a hardcover. Uh, and then we go back. <laughs> we go back to Boston, I'm afraid. <laughs> I seem to be losing the light in this video. We'll just we'll just soldier on. We don't have much more to go. We go back to uh, Boston of centuries past. This is Parnassus Corner. This is the history of the old corner bookshop. Uh, which uh, you can see it on the on the cover there. That is the old corner bookshop, uh, which was Tickner and Fields. It was the home of the publishing house Tickner and Fields, and uh, this is a biography of of uh, Jim Fields and his wife Alice Adams, who who uh, 
or Annie Adams Fields. I don't know if you can make it out here in the fading light. I don't know if you can tell from those pictures. They were gorgeous, both of them. Uh, and they met when they were gorgeous and lived happily ever after. And this is, uh, this is Tryon's bi our biography of the publishing house and also, like uh, uh, Glimpses with Authors, a wonderful portrait of literary Boston of the time. Just, just delightful. Uh, and uh, then we go back, we, for, we go from a biography of Jim Fields to his own book. Uh, this is Yesterday's with Authors. Uh, in which he does much the same thing as uh, as uh, Miss Tickner. He he just goes through authors and and publishing deals and what the day was like. There's a lot. These people were in love with Charles Dickens, so there's lots and lots of Charles Dickens stuff in these books, personal recollections of his visits and correspondences. And it's a little it's a little disappointing for me whenever I read a big soup to nuts Dickens biography that has no idea these books exist when they're priceless primary sources, they're priceless recollections of people who spent time with Dickens and corresponded with him and helped him as an author. You'd be, in, in most Dickens biographies, you'd be hard-pressed to find even a mention of Tickner and Fields, let alone uh, consultations with the letters and reminiscences that are, that are captured in these books. And it isn't just Dickens. It's a whole bunch of people, including a bunch of literary figures who are gone, who are completely forgotten. Uh, and that's a shame. But, but anyway, this and Parnassus Corner and Glimpses of Authors... Uh, they just give you a wonderful, a wonderful look at what literary Boston was like a long time ago, and it's it's full of character and idiosyncratic humor and whatnot. I just love it. I can't get enough of it, as you'll as you'll be able to tell from this library tour. And then the last thing, this book stuck back here is a romance. <laughs> this is Miss Amelia, Lady Amelia's Mess and a Half, by Samantha Grace, and that is the cover with Paul Marin looking his sultry best with his with his shirt unbuttoned and an open letter in his hand. <laughs> uh, and that is it. That is the fifth bookshelf of the tall East Wall bookcase. So uh, as the light fades, so, so we'll move on to the next one next time. Uh, and I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you. <laughs>